Welcome to the second session in the partner breakout room at Soybean Summit. I am Deanna Burkhart, producer and field services administrator for the Illinois Soybean Association and today's room moderator. I'm pleased to introduce this session's speaker, Kevin K.J. Johnson from the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association. He has been with IFCA since 2013 and has served as president since 2021. He is involved in the management of the IFCA, including <laughs> management of IFCA, including oversight of regulatory and legislative issues and the development of programs that promote stewardship and safety for the nutrient and agrochemical industry. Before coming to IFCA, he worked on Capitol Hill and received a bachelor's in agribusiness and political science from Illinois State University. Today, KJ will discuss the global fertilizer and agrochemical market and the factors that impact chemical and fertilizer availability for Illinois farmers. He will also discuss strategies and the chemicals you need for your farm in the next growing season. Before we get started, as a reminder, please use the microphone during the Q&A period so others in the room and also online can hear your questions. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming KJ. Is there a, is there a clicker at all? Thank you. Am I on? Now am I on? Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming to the breakout session again. I'm KJ Johnson with the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association. Uh, see a lot of familiar names or faces in the room. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is just uh, what do we see going on in the industry on a few different things. Got a bunch of slides. We'll see what we get to most. Um, I do want to, one of the issues we are going to talk about. I know as some of you, how many of you were here last night for the dinner? A few of you. We are going to talk about the herbicide strategy. I know Hector talked a lot about that one. That's one of the biggest issues I see. I guess what keeps me up at night. But some of that stuff will be repetitive. But uh, I, I think it's a, that important issue that we need to talk about it a lot. Um, let's just talk about the industry as a whole. And I'm just going to say this is fertilizer. Uh, we belong to three national organizations, the Fertilizer Institute, Crop Life America that handles all the pesticides, and the Ag Retailers Association. Crop Life puts out a actually great report every year, and they actually give it to members of Congress. It's one of the first things that I lay on a, a congressional um, person's desk is the economic impact. This is the economic impact of the whole United States. 33,000 uh, manufacturing jobs, actually 487,000 jobs total. Direct jobs, 400,000. Actually retail jobs, 56,000. That's just for, for national. If you look at Illinois, and we, can, we actually break this down by congressional districts, how the economic impact of fertilizer. There is 30,000 jobs that are somewhat tied to fertilizer or the ag industry here in the state. And we say we are actually a huge economic revenue with $2.3 billion in wages. So that's just a little background how important the fertilizer and chemical industry is from here. Before I go to the next slide, anybody remember where they were at? on a Friday night, September 29th. You remember what, what happened that day, or that night? Anyone want to take a guess? Bob? The wreck in Tutopolis. In Tutopolis. This is one of the, uh, we got a call, um, John Rebholtz on my staff, who's the ammonia guru, I would consider in the nation, we do a lot of ammonia training. We got a call from, um, Actually, my, one of my former board chairmen from the equity and said, hey, there's a major ammonia release um, in between Effingham and Tetopolis. We know it's a cargo transport load of ammonia. We don't know which way it's direction. We don't know if it was going to retail. We don't know anything. Um, that was at 1030 at night. Yeah. And... Um, you guys know I farm. Slept through the night, woke up at 5.30, and got about 20 new text messages that w what was kind of updating what he was giving us. And it was still leaking and getting more information. And that whole day, I uh, was on the phone with federal agencies, the Illinois Department of Ag, what was going on. So here's the background, just so you guys know. There was a wreck earlier that afternoon on out Route 70, they diverted everybody off to Route 40, and then around 8.30 that night, there was a wreck. 
It was a cargo tank, and I'm going to show you guys pictures, um, of 7,500 7, gallons in hydrous ammonia. And we'll see here, the truck took the ditch, and we'll, I'll show you more. A jackknife, it punctured a six-inch hole in the head of that cargo tank. There was five fatalities. Three were at the uh, farm location where it was at, and then two were actually pedestrians, one from Ohio, one from Missouri, in that incident. None was caused by the crash. All right, I'm going to say this, but there wasn't um, the two that passed were actually in their vehicle, but it wouldn't crash, but just it was engulfment. Around 500 uh, residents with a two mile radius were evaluated. The actual NTBSB reported that there was 3,750 gallons of actual ammonia that was released out of that tank, out of the 7,500. And then the next day, NTSB was out there. So this is Totopolis. Here's what actually happened, but we're gonna give you a little better picture. So what happened? There's a curve in the road. Truck was going this way. There was a car that passed that gentleman with another car coming back this way. The gentleman, his father owned the trucking company, and this gentleman was in his uh, late 20s. Um, what probably is going to save him from more and more lawsuits is that he had dash cam in that truck that showed the whole incident in that vehicle. And when we talked to state police that later that day, or Sunday, or Saturday night, Sunday, they said, the, the key word is, he did everything he had to avoid another crash. Because I think the, and I will tell you, if you have a company, have a bunch of trucks, dash cam might be something you want to look at, just for legal purposes. This is the actual site, that's the truck. It actually turned that truck back around. This is the house place. This is, uh, I would just say, energy utility company kind of siding place. That is the actual utility trailer where it hit. And we're going to show you where it hit. But it literally turned that truck. He took the ditch, rolled on its side, and that, it turned that truck completely around. There's some pictures of the, the actual trailer. All the valves, everything else was completely intact. None, all the safety stuff that was, if it would have been a valve or anything like that, was still intact. That is actually the hole that it put in there. That is what put that hole. It hit the hitch of that trailer, that pendle hitch trailer, and put that incision in there. Let me just go back real quick. If you guys remember, um, when we talked to um, contacts that morning, that Saturday morning, about it, like, is it getting sealed? It has not still been sealed. It did not, that tank did not get sealed until about two o'clock that afternoon. It kept on releasing. They tried to put magnets on it to cut, to cut it off. They tried everything. They were actually at the point about flaming it off, but they finally got it to stick to get the, the pressure down on it. Another picture of it. That's a picture of the truck. Why I say this, and I'm going to talk about the next two slides or picture the next two slides. <clears throat> a lot of the coverage on this incident came back to the Department of Transportation of how they diverted stuff from there. Um, we got questions, but I will tell you, we probably ducked a big bolt on this one. But I will tell you, with ammonia, it is getting more and more under the microscope. Uh, what's going to go on. Now here's what I will tell you what I worry about. I live here in, if anybody knows Champaign County, I live the next exit down from here, St. Joe. Go to church here on the west side of Champaign um, this fall. Just going to church on Sunday morning. Saw this out on the west side of town. And you guys, most of you guys know, I, I farm with my family also. I do not want to tell us how we regulate this. But I will tell you, I took these two pictures. This one on the west side here. Pretty nice neighborhood stuff like that. Again, I don't want to tell farmers what to do, but if we have an incident in those kind of positions, we are only going to get more regulation at us. I'm going to talk about pesticide preemption here later on. The one th when we have pesticide preemption in the state, what we do not have in the state is 
fertilizer preemption. How many of you guys remember the spring of 19 when there was ammonia release up in um, uh, Beach Park, Illinois, up on the Wisconsin border? We dug some regulation because we did. How many of you guys have went through ammonia training down in the state of Illinois? That came off of that because of that. That was an agreement with us, the commodity groups, Farm Bureau, Corn and Soy, because of that. And I know some people don't love that, but I will tell you that the, the state senator up that way literally said, if you guys don't come up with some kind of training on this, we will put regulations out. And what she meant by that is, I'm not going to the state. You guys don't have pesticide or fertilizer preemption. That means I can go to the Lake County Board and put a proposal in. And if they want to ban ammonia in Lake County, they can. So we have to get ahead of this. This stuff now, I just think, why I put this, this picture up there is just, there is gonna be more scrutiny on ammonia going forward. But we have to have it in the industry. Uh, I got one of, my, I, one of my guys in this room is on our board. The industry moves probably 70% of all nitrogen in the state is probably through ammonia. A lot of us in the fall. Our retail survey sheds so there's at least, not all, every pound of nitrogen in the fall is put on in the fall, but half of every corn acre is at least put on in the fall. We cannot switch all that to spring. The industry cannot handle it. There's not enough storage that make that all happen. So we, we had to protect ammonia. We also know if there's common sense regulations, there might be looked at after this incident. Let's talk about fertilizer markets. I'm going to kind of touch about what I see going on. I am not a predictor of this. I just see the, what is out there. Here in the last two years, if you looked at the fertilizer market, it's been pretty rocky all over, ups and down. I will tell you, these are all the things that affect the fertilizer market, but we're going to go to the next one. I remember ISA always saying half their soybeans are exported out of Illinois. Well, I would tell you, 90% of the fertilizer in the world is moved outside where it starts from. We are even more affected by global issues than the soy industry is. And if there's a blimp outside our borders, it's going to affect our issues. I put this out here, global consumption. How many guess we had been number three on the nitrogen market? Actually, China's the biggest one of all they're the consumers, phosphates, nitrogen, and potash. I put, I was trying to find a little bit better one than what this is, but this just kind of shows the rockiness of the ammonia markets, what was going on. It has flattened back out again. I think the lowest we got was a like a, the la, or the la, or the week of Farm Progress Show. And now it's kind of ticked back up, but I think we're more in a sideways trade range from now. Cost inputs. Um, I, I put this out here. If you take nothing out of this fertilizer talks I give you, take this. Everything nitrogen starts with is natural gas. Whatever happens in natural gas is going to be a direct correlation of what ammonia is going to do and all other ones, but specifically <clears throat> ammonia. Um, we put this together with the TFI. This talks about just the price, but this box here is the number of companies that are actually producing. Right now, there's 16 different companies that are producing um, ammonia. And this is how many plants are. What you're seeing is, I think it's going to be really hard in the future going and building another plant, but I think it will be retrofitted or expanded. I don't see, the last one that was actually built was in Weaver, Iowa. You guys from the western side of the state, when Weaver Iowa got built, that started off at $1.9 billion start off, and it was well over 4.5 when it was all said and done. Um, and I will tell you, Iowa, um, Terry Brandstead, that was a governor at Iowa at the time a few years ago, literally rolled out the red carpet and said, it will get built. And there were still setbacks on that, on regulation. Do I love to see one here in Illinois built? Absolutely. Do I think it could get through the permitting process? Absolutely not. I'm realistic about that. I'm going to switch over this. Let's get to the bigger thing. <clears throat> Russia plays a huge part in our markets. 
when we saw ammonia go up, it's all because they're a natural gas, but they control a lot of the other stuff. Their export of ammonia is 23% of the world. So when they say they're going to shut down stuff, it affects stuff. They're a big exporter of urea too, but the potash and the phosphates are all. So my biggest worry, I, I, I tell people, and I've said in different interviews, I think fertilizer prices are in a range-bound price right now. I think that's about 80% true. The only 20% of that changes that is, is Putin does something different. If something comes out of Putin that he's going to rock the boat, whatever I just told you is out the boat. But I, it, just tell me what's going to go on with Ukraine. Because all of the fertilizer prices started ticking up when Putin did what? Invaded Ukraine. That's what started a lot of this. Anybody know about Belarus? They are a pretty much a dictatorship. They are 22% of the world's potash. Um, for a time there, no country was dealing with them. Belarus potash is something huge to them. Really, really huge. And they're putting sanctions on those companies. Only Russia was taking them, taking part of their stuff. Um, we talk about um, sanctions and all that stuff. That came from that. And there's a big thing. Russia... They're curbing all exports. Um, they're huge in the urea market, but phosphates too. They, when the, the price is really skyrocketing, China was not exporting any phosphates whatsoever. Now, we're going to see a little later that they're, they're kicking some of that back out, but it's, it's not like it has been. The biggest thing I think drivers going into this year, it's all weather. I mean, we talk about here, but we'll also talk about Brazil. This is the biggest one, if you want to really talk about it. geopolitical unrest, what happens with Russia, um, what's going on in the Red Sea, and then what goes on in China. Microeconomics, some of that, but then supply chains. I'd be honest, supply chains, we put it forward because I, we, I think it is number four. I think the geopolitical and that is going to dictate fertilizer markets more than anything. Supplies, nitrogen from key regions, what we're seeing, again, China, or Russia is exporting, but it's not at the clip it was before. Same thing, um, capacity um, in Europe. And people say, what does it matter? It's Europe. Well, what we saw during the price hike was Europe shut all those off because, and I, we do have a slide. If you look at our natural gas compared to Europe's natural gas, 10x. If it's $2 here, it's going to be 20 or something more higher than that. So that capacity still really hasn't came back online. Imports, again, if you look at everything, we're not taking the imports so like we have been. It is coming back up than what it was in its lows, but it is, it's still not back to, I would say, pre-COVID numbers. Same thing. Here's the big one. Everybody, everybody talks about nitrogen, but the map and DAP, China is still holding on to their stuff. Um, they just see it as, we're going to keep that home. We had to feed our people first. We're going to feed our agricultural first. And they are back to exporting, but not at the clip it was on a five-year average. Same thing with potash production in Belarus and China. It is not back to what it was before. But I will tell you this. This goes back to the world market part of stuff. We don't actually get that much potash outside. I mean, where does most of our potash come from? Canada. Two-thirds of the potash that comes into the state of Illinois is railed in here from Canada. But when all that, when um, there was um, sanctions on Belarus and Russia shut it off, that affected everybody else, and they were, every, all those people were going back on the world market trying to buy. So it drove everything up. I'll end on this on the fertilizer end of stuff. What I think the key drivers are. Urea prices have strengthened a little bit in 24. People say, why do we care about urea? The world nitrogen trades off urea prices. The world nitrogen market is everything is tied to urea prices. We, we think about ammonia or UAN, it's more tied to what everything else is tied to urea. Global ammonia prices decline on a week 
seasonal demand. We actually had a pretty good demand um, here. Actually, I think we had a great demand all fall. If especially the southern two thirds of Illinois was pretty dry, if you wanted to get stuff on, you got it on. I think we are ahead of the game going in, at least here in Illinois, um, going into the spring season on what has to get done. Um, on the P stuff, China exports restrictions have kept global supply tight. The key, if you're a fertilizer guy, is what that is the biggest thing. When does China say we're going to release, open that back up? And if you talk about the case, North American supply relatively tight. Um, it is, but I think most guys got, at least here in this part of the world, got what they wanted on going um, into the future. I do think the P levels will remain strong, though. If we're looking at long-term everything, I think we're in, again, nothing happens global. I think we're in a range-bound prices on, on ammonia and most of the stuff. I don't think we're going to go $1,600 ammonia, but I don't think we're going right back to five five fifty ammonia, though, either. I think we're kind of in a range where we're at. I have to throw this in there, but this is just more, how does this play into the factor of um, the spring? What What is the... The drought monitor look like of what demand is. Here's what I tell you guys. Here's so this is everything is by Henry Hub natural gas price, spot prices. When everything went crazy, this is what was driving that, and now we're back into this price range. But here's the European gas. When it was seven dollars here, it was forty-seven dollars over there. That's how much price difference there was between Europe. And now, and now they're back to this $15 level for natural gas futures. Let's talk about chemical issues that are coming in, what we see in 24. I got to put this out there. I don't love talking about this. Misuse complaints. If I never have to remember 2019 ever again on misuse complaints, I'll be a happy soul. We are um, going back into a better place we are. I would love to say we're going to get back to these levels. I mean, this, it was always this. I think with so much stuff reported in the last few years, I would love to say we're going to go back to those levels. I think we're lying to ourselves. I think there's just more people know how to, to put out those complaints that we're going to be in more of this. But the numbers have come down. Um, even the, if you look at the blue line, that's when they started recording the dicamba complaints. They were actually down to 37 complaints. Here's the one I think we're gonna we're gonna relate to. Purple line, um, IDNR complaints or tree complaints. That's what we're gonna work on. Anybody, anybody get the news gazette here in Champaign? This was your spring headline one day. Um, there was a just southwest of here in Seymour. There was a bunch of tree complaints. Um, this is the one that I think we're gonna have to deal with more and more. Talking to our our environmental friends down in Springfield, when we have to have those conversations, tough conversations, you know, I always remember them telling us, you kill each other's beans, that's one thing, whatever. You kill the trees, then we're going to have real issues. Um, there is a hotbed of complaints on tree complaints. Any of you guys down in Washington County at all? I know my board's probably sick of me hearing say this, but we're going to have to deal with that. The pin oaks down there, any kind of oaks, are showing some kind of symptoms down that way. How do we get a hold of that issue? Let's kind of focus on um, Springfield stuff. I will tell you, there's very few fertilizer-related stuff on going down Springfield, more on the nutrient loss reduction strategy. It is all based on fertilizer or pesticides. The anti bills are heavy, and we're going to go through some of that stuff, talking more chemistries. Um, seed treatments, we're going to talk about that, a growing concern on seed treatments. We're seeing legislation. Um, climate and soils is a good thing. We're working on some of that. Actually, Chris, you talked here, working with him on some stuff that might be a, but local ad, activism. I've never seen where you will get a um, very, very conservative, but a very, very little person growing one thing, and that is local control. And we are doing it because we are more pushing for state control and stuff. But we're going to talk about this. 
some bills that we are watching. This is one that just got dropped a couple of days ago, and we got a hearing on it next Tuesday, or sorry, next Thursday. Got pushed to us in the Ag Committee. I talk about fertilizer preemption. Um, anybody know what pesticide preemption means? It's probably one of the best things that Burleson can't answer in the back. Um, most, one of the most thing, positive things we have in the industry. Pesticide preemption means that the state of Illinois regulates that pesticide rather than Champaign County, the city of Urbana, or anything like that. It has to, the director of ag has full control over that. Now some are like, well, I don't want the director of ag. I will tell you right now, that is where you want. If you're going to try and battle every local town, stuff like that, it's going to be hard. There's a piece of legislation put in by Laura Fine from uh, Chicago, which says uh, a city of two million or county, a county of two million or more, and if you go dig through that, that is Cook County, can regulate their own pesticides. Now, the city of Chicago does have authority to regulate its own pesticide, but they still defer to the state of Illinois. What this would do would let any town in Cook County, without saying Cook County, it just says two million or more, but any subdivision, any Hyde Park or Eagle Crest subdivision could ban pesticides. This is an issue for IFSA that we, there's no negotiate on. We, we will fight for preemption with all it's worth. We're gonna have this conversation next week. Do I think this actually moves? No. I think there's controls in the Senate to get it stopped. If it goes to the House, that's another thing. The House is, is pretty raucous right now of letting stuff move. But this is a very big issue that we are watching, probably our number one concern in the state of Illinois right now. There's a dicamba ban out there. To be honest with you, a lot of these, I think, are what I call fisher bills, people just trying to get by to see what goes out there. Um, I don't think this is going anywhere, but it's just out there. We got a neonic ban. Neo, anybody know what your neonics are? That's your seed treatments. This would ban it on state of Illinois lands, but anybody farm any U of I ground? That's a state of Illinois land. So there is some conversation about that. That bill has been out there for a while, I, it, but it, it's, the only reason I, I bring this back up is it's been out there every year that I've been around, but the state of New York did ban all neonics and seed treatments starting in 20, what is it, Bertelson? But it's all on all agricultural pre -owned. It's a bad. And that didn't, then it was, hey, we're going to ban it, and then we're going to give exceptions out. It was pretty hard and firm. That's done. It is done. So I think there will be a renewed effort in a lot of states, not just here in Illinois, on, on seed treatments. There's a glyphosate ban. That's going to come back. Clefirifos, any of you guys know a Clefirifos? That's a Dow legacy product. It's going to get started and weeded out, but somebody thought we need to put it out there. Okay, let's talk about the fun subject of the day. Again, how many were you at, at the dinner last night and heard Hector speak? How many of you guys, how many, oh, sorry, how many of you even heard about the herbicide strategy? This is one of those issues that keeps me up at night. Herbicide strategy is because um, the Center of Biological Diversity has sued EPA over many times about that they are not taking Endangered Species Act into um, how they regulate pesticides. That's what it boils down to at the end of the day. I will tell you, EPA has lost many cases on this, and now they call it the mega suit of uh, multiple cases that they have lost on this one. And now EPA is tasked to put this out. They're going to do herbicides, they're going to do insecticides, rodenticides, but herbicides was the first one they put out. Um, the per is honest, I don't think EPA loves this because it is going to be a ton more work onto them, but they are being ordered by the courts to move this. I'm going to say, how many of you guys used Enlist yet last year? Okay. 
How many did you guys, how many of you did the pick list? There's a few. How many even knew that was on there? This is what you're, uh, we're going to look at. This is what it all comes down to on the Endangered Species Act, is these pick lists and getting to different scenarios, you know, four to six credits, but in certain areas you might have to get to, like if you listen to Hector's talk last night, seven or nine credits to get to this. As my personal opinion, it's going to be hard because I, I will tell you, I own a little land, but I also rent a lot, some land. Some of the options that are on these uh, contours or buffer strips, can I just go do that if I rent a piece of land to say I'm going to go put that out there? Absolutely not. This is going to be a larger conversation with landowners, how this goes forward. Um, it is going to be a definitely a more complex label from here. Um, you're going to have to keep more records on this. One of the biggest things as our members, the vast majority of our members are the retailers. We've always known that when we spray a herbicide, if I spray it um, for Bob, if it drifts, it's not Bob's problem. It is whoever's in that cab of that applicator has, will have the penalties to get them. But on this, if I ask Bob, Bob, have you done all your pick list info on enlist? And Bob just says yes. And it, he hasn't, and it comes back. How can I verify that Bob did that, all that? It's going to be a whole lot more bigger issue on us. And we're asking EPA, how does that look like? Um, I definitely think there's going to be more buffers on everything. There's conversation about that last night more. Um, we're going to be looking at pollinators more and what's, what's a treated area. Um, here's the biggest one, I think, is the $64,000 question. What does Department of Ag do? I would tell you Department of Ag is pretty overworked on the pesticide department right now. It's taken them a whole year to get through pesticide complaints right now. If you add this onto them, it is going to put them over. I know it's called NASDA. It represents all the state departments ag. They are going back to EPA and asking the question, and I know their members, like the Illinois Department of Ag, are asking, hey, if you put this out there, are you going to give us appropriation to hire more people? Because we don't got the manpower to do it. So there's still a whole lot more questions. And I will tell you, the whole thing with the herbicide strategy is there's more questions than answers on this. What's driving it? And as I told you, it's all about the lawsuits at the end of the day. I'm going to go through some. So just so you guys know what, what has changed, 1972, FIFRA. Everything we know on pesticide, it's like the Illinois Pesticide Act of the National Law. It regulates all pesticides or all pesticides. Um, it's a risk-benefit statute, no reasonable effect on the environment. Unre no unreasonable effects, okay? That's how that reads. But the Endangered Species Act was passed just one year later. It was 50 last year, and it's zero. There's zero. If it kills one endangered species, it's a no-go. It's a whole different level of regulation. What we're going to talk on here, Endangered Species Act, does it jeopardize or contain, goes as any, this is the key, any listed species or destroy any critical habitat. The other thing that's going to be, what we're going to see going on is, is the habitat. How close are you to the habitat? And again, if you listen to Hector's thing last night, he showed some of those areas that was pretty good size. If you looked at Illinois, one of his slides was two-thirds of the state trying to narrow some of that down. If you, any, of, any of you are in northern Illinois, one of these that will be affected with the, is the Rusty Pass bumblebee. Will be a direct effect. You go off over it. Now, before I go to the next slide, I want to check just time, where I'm on time. When you think of the Endangered Species Act, what do you think of? Throw it out there, guys. Wolf, owl, Yep. I'm going to do this real quick. Here's what I'm pulling it out. There are 1,600 endangered species. 940 of them are plant-based. This is where we worry about. This is where Dr. Hager and I go have a beer and figure out 
how do we hit our head against the wall without doing it? Because why? Prime example, glyphosate. Glyphosate don't kill giant ragweed anymore, but it still kills a lot of other stuff. How does that affect if it's an endangered species, a plant-based species, on that? But that affects everything long term. Let me go back. I'm going to give you this one. Jake uh, Lee is the head of the pesticide division. I actually know Jake personally. Um, worked on the Hill for him, with him for a little bit. I, I like Jake personally. But he got ahead of the pesticide division. He made this comment, and this is where it scared everybody. Um, pesticide program and knowledge that the agency has, has registered and registered pesticides without thoroughly using the ESA process for decades. That's what scares us. They are admitting to this. I won't go through. So, have you already been affected by ESA? Absolutely. How many of you guys sprayed that Camba the last couple of years and you guys are in one of these counties and have to go to the bigger buffer zones? That is all part of ESA. How many of you guys have been in a county that had a, a buffer zone and then it was taken away? Anybody live in Champaign County? Part of that. It changed every year. This is what part of the ESA. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. There's some other stuff I want to talk about. This is going, this goes to this Russell Pass bumblebee, the, the areas. And again, there's more different maps out there, what is out there. But if you are in that, you are going to have to comply or you're not going to use any of those types of products. I got five minutes. I'm going to quick go through some stuff on DC, your government work. As much as I think Springfield screwed up, then I look at DC and it's even more screwed up. Um, let's just talk about Farm Bill. Jonathan, I go way back with Jonathan, um, talking about Farm Bill. I think, I actually do think we're going to get something done this year. As, as much as I'm cynical about that, I think it is a pretty flat looking Farm Bill, nothing new. He talked about the CBO scoring. There is no new money out there for any. I think it's going to be really hard for new programs to be done. What are we looking at? Critical minerals, adding potash and phosphate. And that just gives more protection to those things as critical. If there's a, a shutdown, it helps us. Biostimulants, there's a, a big call on biostimulants. Um, one thing that we're watching is that there's some kind of standard of biostimulants, just not. You want to say snake oils, there's just not snake oils out there. Um, having a better part of this. TSP, Lisa Martin, this is our big issue. Helping get um, CCA advisors be able to write nutrient management plans. I know a new, or NRCS does a lot of that right now, but they are pretty far behind. We're asking that CCAs can write those nutrient management plans through the farm bill. Right now they cannot. And then just streamlining some of the conservation practices that we're backing. Um, we actually want to see conservation practices put out there, but if there's a streamlining of some of those. Here's your key figures. Debbie Stabenow from Michigan, who's the Democrat lead. Uh, Debbie's a pretty nice lady. Uh, Jonathan actually used to work for her, but she is retiring at the end of the year. I think Jonathan made the comment last night, and I actually agree with him. This is her last go-around. I think she actually does want to pass something. I think they're really a push for her to get it done. Bozeman, um, I, I like John, um, but can they, can they get something done? If, here's the thing, and we'll talk about this later. I think the Senate's going to flip the Republican. If you're John Bozeman, do you help Debbie, or do you say, I'll try and write it next year? That's the biggest thing, I think, the conversation. G.T. Thompson is the lead in the um, House. He's from Pennsylvania. Really good guy. But... Um, he announced about a month ago he's got prostate cancer. I think that slows a little bit of him down on some stuff. How much is there push in the house on that? And then David Scott out of Georgia from the Elena area. Decent guy, but his main focus is food and nutritional. Where does that drive from? And as you guys know, I used to work on farm bills all the time. 84% of the, new, the, the total funding of the farm bill is going to be um, nutritional stuff. It is not crop insurance or that. It's the big part of that. I did, this is one I want to show you. How much has Congress moved in the last Congress? We've only enacted 30 bills. 
Now, if you like that you, nothing passes, it's great. But I think that's why they're going to, the Republicans are probably going to lose the House. They, they pretty much have a two-seat majority. Dems think they can flip that in New York and California right now. Here's the House makeup. Here's what I want to get. If you're a really political insider, um, Cook Report, Re Political Report puts out a bunch of stuff. This is the toss-ups they have. They actually have more toss-ups in um, GOP districts than Dems. That gives you a good report that he thinks it's going to go that way. And again, they really only got to flip two, three seats, and the Dems are control. Now here's the flip side. The Dems and Independents must defend 23 seats. I actually think the Senate's going to flip to Republican. The Republicans, I will tell you right now, we're only going to pick up two seats. One is Manchin in West Virginia. Let's just be honest. Do we think another Dem's going to win West Virginia right now? Probably not. Um, Stab and I was open. I think that will be a probably one of the largest spent seats out there on stuff. The Republican, their seats that are all open are pretty, I would say, safe out there. Tester Montana is up. I think they could get a good run of money for him, and there's a few others. That is all I have. I went through pretty quickly a lot of that. Questions, thoughts, fertilizer prices, her herbicide strategy, or just what's going on in Springfield or D.C.? Guys, I thank you very much. If you have anything, um, let me know. We are, I guess, I'll, last thing I'll leave with you guys. We are going to work with Soybean on a legislative event on March 6th. We'd love to see you down in Springfield. But I think our groups, as all Kamai groups, that means us, soy, corn, farm bureau, beef, pork, especially in Springfield, are going to have to lock arms together to stop some of the stuff. Or if we're going to even move anything, like on a state tax, there's some talks, that I didn't bring up a state tax, we must be interlocked together. With this general assembly, how it is, if, we, if they see any differences of where we're at on opinions, I don't think we get stuff passed. And I think it's going to be more than ever that us commodity groups or ag organizations are all on the same page with each other. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you, KJ.